Hi, everyone. Welcome to Get Gut Happy. Uh, Joey Thomas and I, Luann Hopkinson, are a naturopath, Joey, and nutritionist, respectively. And we love to sit down and have a cup of tea and chat about the gut. And we thought, why don't we jump on here and chat with all of you as well? So Joey is um, the wonderful practitioner who runs the Happy Belly Method, which is about everything gut related. And I run the Happy Without Histamine Method program, which supports people with histamine intolerance and mast cell activation. Welcome, Joey. So Hi. Hi, Luann. How are you doing? <laughs> Good. And Joey and I are going to have a chat about um, SIBO today. And Joey's had heaps of experience with this herself and with her practitioners. And um, we thought we'd have a chat about the different types of SIBO and how this could be affecting you. So, Joey, what was your experience like with SIBO? So for me, um, I was initially diagnosed with fructose malabsorption. I did, you know, the three breath tests. So I think I did two. I did lactose and I did fructose. And um, I, I got pretty high results pretty early and they sent me home. Didn't stay there for very long. And then I sort of got given this list of foods and I headed home and felt very overwhelmed. And it wasn't actually until about two years later that um, someone suggested maybe I had SIBO. So I went back and did that test and that came out positive straight away. So yeah, I was a bit of an odd one because my digestive symptoms weren't my sort of main driver or main concern. Like my main thing was I had chronic fatigue. I was for about two years or more and a lot of mental health problems. So a lot of struggle with anxiety and depression. So yeah, my gut was like, I had symptoms, but it wasn't anything that major. It was the sort yeah. of fatigue for me. So it was quite different. Yeah, pretty mild. And that's it. Like a lot of people will only go and get their gut checked or tested if they've got digestive symptoms. Whereas, you know, as we can see that a lot of times what's going on um, doesn't show up in the body as a digestive symptom or might be really mild digestive symptoms, but then you might just be absolutely exhausted and, you know, I've been there too. I had ME-CFS as well. And um, surprising how much of the guts, the situation or what's going on in the gut that really um, relates through to fatigue and anxiety and depression that we just don't think about. Yeah, for me, I had really, really poor sleep as well. So fatigue yeah. combined with poor sleep is not very much fun at all. <laughs> um and yeah it's sort of strange for people to sort of say oh I'm tired and I can't sleep but yeah I think it's very right. much related to that if serotonin's low and your mood hormones which is all related to your gut bacteria then your melatonin's going to be low as well so yeah, yeah. that can be another yeah. thing so yeah yeah and because of the gut brain axis as well we've got that connection with um the gut and stress and anxiety and vice versa because there's messages going from the brain to the gut and the gut to the brain all the time yeah and so you know really understanding that what's going on in our gut affects our mental health so much and our sleep and our stress levels and all of those kinds of things too yeah and of course like your inflammatory response so the inflammation of the gut and then the inflammation of the brain and then how that impacts yeah energy production and mood and yeah, yeah everything and your cortisol you'd have high really really high cortisol so that's another factor that impacts your sleep or your or your anxiety or whatever else so yeah, yeah. and all your immune systems so that was the other thing I was getting sick like every month <laughs> every month <laughs> I'd be sick two or three weeks I'd be better for a week or two and then I'd be sick again and I was just losing the plot I was yeah. so over it. Yeah. yeah. I think you were very much the same. Yeah. Like I had MECFS, I had fibromyalgia. Um, I was trying at that point to heal with um, heavy metal therapy because I had really high heavy metals, but I didn't understand, even though I was seeing a doctor that was doing all of this stuff, I didn't understand that if your detox systems are working properly and your gut's working properly, then you actually detoxify things like heavy metals. They don't accumulate in your body, you know, and understanding that actually the gut uh, and, and those other parts of our digestive system, like our liver, 
was so important. And I didn't understand that at the time because that was uh, just prior to starting to study or just when I started studying nutrition. And of course, at school, when we study nutrition um, in college, they don't go into great detail around digestive um, stuff in the way that we do when we become post-grad and then we go and do a lot of extra study and we find out what way more about SIBO and about um, the gut microbiome and a lot more detail um, then. But um, yeah, I kind of wish I knew then what I knew now. <laughs> That's for sure. I think we all do. I think, um, yeah. But I think that the things that we went through and the experiences and the hard times we go through and is where you learn and where you can take that knowledge and help others. So, yeah. 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 And that's it. And then, and knowing that also what I know now is, you know, how I, I went from MEC of fierce and, and fibromyalgia and just avoiding gluten. That was really the only thing that bothered me then to developing histamine intolerance and mast cell activation and how if we don't address things, they can get worse over yeah. time you know we can feel like we're ticking along okay and we're just avoiding gluten for five years um but then eventually things can get worse um and uh, you know my personal experience was was um SIBO but I had a different form than you did I had something called hydrogen sulfide SIBO and also hydrogen sulfide LIBO as well um and that is a different type of bacteria, again, a very pro-inflammatory bacteria um, that um, loves meat and fat and things like that. And really interesting because I'd gone paleo prior, you know, I'd been eating quite a high saturated fat, lots of coconut oil, stuff like that, because I'd, I'd gone down this paleo route as part of my healing journey. Mm. And uh, sometimes the diets we think are good for us actually end up making us worse. Yeah, I think a lot of paleo diets can end up being very high fat, low carb. And it, that can work, but it depends on how much you take that to an extreme. And yeah, I was sort of doing similar. I think it was quite trendy for, it's probably the same kind of year that you did it. I yeah. remember. I, was, I quit okay. sugar and then I went and did paleo. So it was probably around the same time. It was probably around 2016, 2017, something like that. But um, yeah, it, it didn't really work for me. I was sort of intimate. I was doing all of that. I was intermittent fasting. I was doing really low carb. I wasn't um, touching rice or pasta or potatoes at all. Um, I'd make like my zucchini pasta. And yeah, I thought I was doing all the right things, but it caused probably not, I didn't notice the digestive issues. For me, it sort of tanked my thyroid and it caused a lot more stress on my system. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think it can work for some people going through that approach, but there's so many nuances with diet and their impact on the different systems. And I yeah. think, yeah, I think we can sort of jump on board these things and think that we're doing the right thing. But yeah, I think everyone needs a different approach depending on what's going on. Yeah. And you had hydrogen um, SIBO, is that right? The hydrogen time. Yeah, I was always, yeah. The smell absorption. Yeah. So I think as we chatted before, your hydrogen SIBO. So SIBO, we should say, stands for small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. I was going to chime in. And then the LIBO that Luann mentioned before stands for large intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Um, they, yeah, they're similar because you've got sort of bad bacteria that's sort of messing with the two areas. But when it's in your small intestine, those gases actually damage the villi and they can cause a lot more food intolerances because the digestive enzymes um, aren't produced or as effective um and it can and it can also uh, mess with the bile um and how effective that is in breaking down um, fats and stuff in the diet and then also those fat soluble nutrients so there's a lot of sort of um carry-on effects when you have the small intestinal bacterial overgrowth but then yeah there's problems with both i guess well yeah um, if you have the lower intestinal bacterial overgrowth that's your immune system and that's where you get the inflammatory proteins that come from the bacteria, all those what we call endotoxins. Mm. And then they're triggering our immune system. They're triggering inflammation. And we get this inflammatory cascade and it becomes quite cyclic really, doesn't it? Yeah, that's really, you explained that really well. Love that. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, and then once that immune system's activated, there's just so many other things that can happen. So yeah, some people end up getting like an autoimmune disease or they get joint pain or they get thyroid problems or they get, sometimes it can, yeah, diabetes even. So yeah, um, yeah. yeah. that's where so, the mast cell activation and the histamine intolerance can come in as well as people who have sensitivities to like salicylates or oxalates or any kind of food group, right? Because mm. our immune system's being triggered. Yeah, it's just constantly busy. It's constantly just on the lookout and just highly yeah. reactive. So it sort of doesn't matter what you avoid. You're just always just reacting and you're always exhausted by it. So yeah. Well, yeah. our immune system uses up so much energy in our body. It's no wonder we get fatigued, right? I mean, it's just draining yeah. all of our energy. Our body is constantly trying to fight this bacteria that's it's inside us so you know and it's interesting because our insides are really our outsides because it's kind of like having a layer of skin you know that we have with the outside world it's just it's a tube that goes from our mouth to our anus and it's kind of an outside world it's not inside our body as such it's it's you know it's kind of like this this little ecosystem of bacteria that are inside us but as far as our body's concerned that's not in our body that's from the outside it's like it's like anything that's coming in has to be filtered through this little thin layer of skin on our gut lining to protect mm. us yeah 100 percent. yeah so jumping back we'll sort of talk we started to talk about different types of SIBO yeah. so the hydrogen um I was definitely like diarrhea prone so loose stool which is more of that hydrogen SIBO picture and then you've also got your methane SIBO which I see quite a lot and sometimes people have a combo of all two like yeah, two, two of them true. or three of them yeah, um, yeah. your methane will be typically um, more constipation it actually um, the methane anesthetizes the um, the nerves in the bowel and it slows down the whole process so unless you fix that you can't you, you, you can kill off the bacteria, but they're just going to keep growing back because they're just sitting there and not moving. So yeah. that would be a little bit more, a little bit more difficult to treat. But often I see people have got both the hydrogen and the methane SIBO and they sort of go between getting diarrhea one day and then constipation the next. And I think those people, and I was a little bit like that sometimes as well. They're the ones that don't seek treatment because they don't say, oh yeah, I've got, I've got diarrhea or I've got constipation because yeah. they're they're swinging and so they yeah, sort of IBSM yeah. it's called isn't it IBS mixed where you yeah IBSM yeah. The two. Yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah and then maybe you talk a little bit more about the hydrogen sulfur or hydrogen sulfide SIBO because I think yeah. that's sort of quite new well the whole hydrogen sulfide SIBO is one that yeah people didn't really um know about it for a while because it doesn't show up on the tests so when we do a test, we test for hydrogen SIBO, we test for methane SIBO. And the only real way you can test for hydrogen sulfide SIBO a lot of the times is by being a skilled practitioner who can read the tests and then match them up with the symptoms and realize that there's nothing showing in these tests and that's because of hydrogen sulfide. And then we can kind of cross match that to what's happening in the stool sample as well. We can kind of... Um, put the picture together of the pattern of all the things that are happening but it's not as simple most of the time you can't just get a single test and go yep this is the thing mm. and the hydrogen sulfide is usually more diarrhea and as you said hydrogen is a little bit more diarrhea and hydrogen sulfide is a little bit more diarrhea so you can't always just say oh it's diarrhea it's this one mm. sometimes you can it's really obvious but sometimes you can't yeah um, so yeah. what were your what were your main symptoms with the hydrogen sulfide? Yeah, so I had I had 24 hour diarrhea. I lost 30 kilos. Oh wow. I didn't actually yeah. know you lost that much. Yeah. Hold yeah. On. From from lack of absorption um and constant diarrhea. And it was just it was just, yeah, just the mast cells as well line our line our gut. And mm. once they get triggered, um they will go into basically you know it's that same response that our body gets when we're uh, in fight flight which is say for example someone's you know they get robbed and they they you know they pee and they poop because our body just lets everything out and it mm. can kind of go like that with the mast cells in our gut it can just be like 
constantly get everything out because mm. the bacteria in there is just causing so much of a problem I suppose that's our body's natural way of dealing with it yeah that makes sense it's just trying to yeah. expel the bad stuff out. yeah yeah and, and then of course I had you know I had histamine intolerance and mast cell activation so I had a lot of symptoms going on as well as you know fatigue and joint pain I had rashes I had this burning overnight heat that I'd be waking up in panic attacks with my pillow so hot you could touch it and it was just insane how hot you, it was you were like sensitive to like were you sensitive light and noise as well uh, noise it was noise, noise. Uh, I couldn't wear headphones I had tinnitus yeah um you know I had um a lot of anxiety as well um, and there were all these panic attacks because the symptoms were so scary because I was having um, anaphylaxis. So, you know, swelling throat, mouth. I had something called burning mouth syndrome. Um, yeah. Where, you know, your tongue and your gums are all just, yeah, they're just, it's just burning and sore and swollen and inflamed and, you know, you get this big crevice down your tongue when you have that allergic tongue where it puffs up. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Do you think they sometimes that can be related to B12, did they say, with the burning well, tongue? it can, I think. Um, There'd always be multiple reasons. It's so, not yeah. always, yeah. Uh, I know that, you know, I never had a problem with B12. Mm. Uh, and I don't find most of my clients have that. In fact, most of the time, people with histamine intolerance and mast cell activation usually show high B12 because there's usually some problem with um, converting the B12. And the liver maybe, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so, um, but yeah, I had a whole host of crazy stuff um, Mm. going on and I was housebound and, um, you know, so much um, going on and the gut stuff was part of that picture there was a lot of other things I worked on too but definitely um, when you've got the bacteria going on in your digestive tract in that way um, you really do need to get them under control yeah Uh, you know for me it was a very slow process because I was not able to take much in the way of supplementation and when I did like I remember I did take a bunch of herbs at one time and it actually just got worse yeah yeah I've been through die off from taking herbs and yeah it's just complete exhaustion yeah. and sometimes yeah I think it, it messed with my mood as well I think they're yeah. my, my weak spots yeah. um but yeah it really it makes you feel like you're hung over con- constantly you just got that yeah. that surge in LPS in your bloodstream and you're just highly inflamed yeah and, and yeah. sometimes that's the thing and and you know with the especially with sensitive patients or if they've already had previous treatment or, or that sort of thing sometimes when a practitioner uses herbs they actually are killing off too much and, and the mm. good bacteria is dying off as well and the problem is we need the good bacteria to fill the space once we've killed the bad guys off. And if you don't have enough good bacteria and you're taking the herbs and everything gets wiped out, that's when you can end up with diarrhea that never stops or you can end up in much worse situations because you don't have um, enough of those resources and you're needing to actually approach it in a different way and actually work on restoring the microbiome rather than the kill 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 which is you know often the first the first choice is to just go in with some really strong herbs that are kind of like throwing a big bomb yeah on the whole system. yeah and yeah and I think a lot of people don't realize that when we have probiotics they don't they don't plant they don't seed they yeah. just want to go for our system while we're having them and they exert an, an effect. And then once we stop having them, they don't they don't plant themselves in our digestive tract work like a lot of people think. And, yeah. and also once we kill off a certain strain of bacteria, once we kill it, when we properly kill every single one of them, they can't grow back. They're gone. Yeah. So, yeah, I think. Um, and then that's the same. If you have kids, then you're going to pass down that gut bacteria that's missing that strain to the next generation and then the next one. So there's that sort of legacy that gets passed down as well. Yeah. So. Which is probably why we're seeing more and more and more kids with B12 
food sensitivities and stuff like that as well. You know, we've had so many antibiotics through the last few generations. Mm. And, um, the good news is sometimes we can find that there are bacteria that are hiding in the appendix or, you know, little bits and, and we can feed them up. Um, and it's But it's a very slow process to get them fed back up again when they've been taken down to such tiny numbers as well. Yeah, and then sometimes, um, like Jason Horolak, um, he talks a lot about how it might be, I think it says DL on some tests when there's none. And yeah. sometimes, you, yeah, you can give the right prebiotic and you can see it come back up, like yeah. you said. Um, so even if it says it's not there on the test, it might be just below the detectable te detectable levels for that particular lab. Yeah. And yeah. we might you might still be able to bring it back up. So there is hope, like you said. But yeah. yeah, you think you've really got to, like you said, you've got to find the balance and not just focus on killing. I think it's really important to to feed that beneficial bacteria through through not just like supplements, but through diet. Diet's okay. Yeah, yeah. And the thing about diet as well is doing the right diet at the right time. Because a lot of times it's like, okay, it will start on this low FODMAP diet or this low histamine diet or whatever, and then someone will just stay on that forever. Mm -hmm. and when we work with clients, we go, okay, we're going to do this diet for like three weeks or four weeks or six weeks. And then we're going to see what's happening. And then we're going to tweak it. And we're going to introduce some more stuff. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to tweak it again. And we're going to focus on, okay, like this bacteria that you need that you don't have enough of, we're going to feed it. We're going to feed it some pomegranate or we're going to feed it, you know, some resistant starch from cooked cold potatoes or whatever it is that we we see and then we're going to focus on okay yeah we can target with the diet as well as with supplements mm, yeah 100 percent. so yeah i i've met so many patients that have been doing fodmap diet for like 10 years plus and yeah and they're in such a state if, state like if they eat a tiny speck of something that they shouldn't their, their symptoms are crazy and it was never, ever designed by Sue Shepard and who put it together to, to do for that long. So, yeah, I no, think they say no. six to eight weeks and then start to reintroduce. But which is all well and good. But I think if you don't have that support in fixing what's wrong with the digestive tract, then when you start to bring the food back in, a lot of the time it, it doesn't work out. It doesn't. No, it doesn't. It People doesn't. react and then they just go back to avoiding it and then that that just stays their thing for the next few years. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Because either there's still bacteria in the wrong place. It's it's bacteria that's eating this fodmap food, and it's up in the small intestine where it's not supposed to be, because there's not supposed to be a lot of bacteria there. Or everything's been killed off, so there's not enough bacteria to actually um, manage the amount, the quantity of fiber that's coming in, and then. Mm then you get symptoms, you get bloating and stuff because, well, if the bacteria aren't there, then the fibres, they ferment and and you get the bloating and all of that kind of thing, right? Yeah, and the pain and the distension and the pregnant belly. <laughs> send pictures on Facebook. I've seen a few. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I think um, maybe we'll talk about some of the ways aside from diet that you kind of got on top of your digestive symptoms, because I know that you did more than diet. We'll maybe touch on that and then we might sort of oh, yeah. finish yeah. it up and do another topic in, I don't know, next week or so. Yeah. And, and people can let us know other topics. Like if you guys think of a topic that you want us to talk about, just comment, let us know, and we'll just get back together and we'll just have a bit of a chat about it. and um you know it's very unscripted as you can see um but yeah so I used a lot of um nervous system work to help because we know about this gut brain connection and it's going two ways it's not just brain to gut um, and gut to brain it's it's like um we can control it from both angles and so when I was in my worst place I couldn't take any supplements and I was down to five foods. Like I was really. Can you tell me, can you tell us the five foods again? Yeah. Um, rice. I was actually eating brown rice because I was still trying to keep fiber in my diet the best that I could. And I was eating bok choy, chicken, uh, lamb, olive oil. And that was it. And salt. So could you have olives, but not. No, no, you no. see, olive oil is... That's olive oil. 
olive oil is low in histamine, but olives are high because they're, you know, they're like preserved and stuff. Um, and being that I knew enough about nutrition, like I, you know, I was, I was a nutritionist and I knew that this wasn't good, but I actually had a brain and a nervous system and a body that wouldn't allow me to reintroduce the food. Yeah. I'm like, sure a lot of people thought you were a bit crazy at the time. Oh, yeah. yeah. It yeah, would have been really like, tough. Yeah. Why, why are you only eating that many food? And it's like, well, because if I eat anything else, I get all these symptoms, right? And that's what was happening. But actually what was happening is I was having so many symptoms, 24 hours every day, seven days a week, so many symptoms that really the reason that I was eating so little food was because they were happening all the time and I couldn't tell what was happening. Yeah. And so when you can't tell what's happening and you're focused on the food, you keep pulling the food out. And that's what happens to a lot of my clients that I see. They've come to me and they're really stuck because the symptoms are all the time. And we're so used to thinking that we should be able to do a food symptom diary and we should be able to go, okay, it's this food and it's this symptom. But the reality is we know it's not that simple because it's not the food, it's probably the bacteria in your gut that are causing the symptoms and it might not have anything to do with that particular food. Yeah, and the food you might... Sometimes it doesn't. Sorry, I talked over you. Yeah, and you might be reacting to a food you had three days before as well, which makes it you've eaten however many foods across three days. It's just so hard to pinpoint, like definitely sometimes. Absolutely, because histamine takes about three days to, you know, um, be metabolised in the body and it can take longer if people's, um, you know, metabolism, their, their liver and, and everything's not working very well. And then also... It takes a while for food to travel all the way through your gut. And for some people, their gut motility, which is, you know, the, the movement or the speed of how things move through. Some people, it's 24 hours. Other people, it can be a week, you know. And so yeah. you don't, you, it's very hard to tell. But we are used to, as a society, and particularly all the practitioners are used to kind of looking for these, what have you eaten, um, and relationship to, to food and symptoms, which in reality, it's much more related to this bacteria inflammation immune cycle that's going on in our and gut. It, and, and stress as well. Stress in our yeah. brain because of our reaction to our symptoms and also whatever else is going on around us. Because having a chronic illness is stressful in itself, right? If you've got MECFS, if you've got fibromyalgia, if you've got mast cell whatever you've got, it's stressful having a chronic illness. And even if the chronic illness is something like IBS, which people have normalized as just being just IBS, that's stressful. Mm. If you're always trying to figure out where a bathroom is and you're worried that you can't go somewhere because you might need to go to the toilet in that 10 minute walk, that's stressful. And um, so that, you know, a lot of the work I did was on, the stress response and on the brain because when you get into that cycle of symptoms and fear of symptoms and then symptoms and fear of symptoms actually the fear is feeding the symptoms mm -hmm. and a lot of times we don't notice it because we're in it when you're in it you just can't see mm -hmm. it you know and so really recognizing that our brain and how it works and how we think has so much of an impact of what's going on in our body. And, you know, they've done research. Um, Monash University did research into using hypnosis for IBS and found um, significant results, you know, that it can improve it. And if you have something like IBS, you can definitely use hypnosis and other things. When you get further down the track to where I went, um, I, it's a, I think hypnosis can be helpful, but not always enough. And so I use some neuroplasticity work, um, which is also sometimes called neural retraining or brain retraining. Yeah. And then also I did use a bit of hypnosis and also some meditation and gentle stuff like Qigong or tai yeah. qi, like really gentle movement. Um, and that kind of approach helps to actually change what's going on in our gut because it changes how our gut 
functions because we know if our gut is well if our brain is in fight flight right when we're in fight flight when we're when we're in the state where we're stressed our body takes all the blood and nutrients away from our gut sends it all to our muscles because we need to run or we need to fight right if there's a tiger or something that's just how our body is wired from like you know caveman times mm-hmm. and then what we need to be is we need to be in the opposite which is rest and digest and that's why it's rest and digest because that's when all our blood goes to our gut and it goes to all of our detox organs and it goes to all of that core of our body all of our organs then get nourished and of course our gut will not work properly if it's not getting nutrients if it's not getting blood and it's not getting the nerves working so the nerves in our stomach turn off when we go into fight flight and they turn back on again when we go into rest and digest so that's why you know the gut motility we talked about things slow right down Mm. because we're going into fight flight or they speed up because the gut's getting rid of everything yeah 100 percent. how how long i guess it's hard to put a time on things but how long did you do that sort of nervous system work before you really started to see it shift in your digestive state it took me a while i've got to say um and i i i do sometimes wonder if i tell people how long it takes them it'll put them off well i think it's all it's all about trial and error and you went through that trial and error so the next person doesn't have to i know people who had got all their foods back in three months of doing this kind of neuroplasticity work Hmm. um and but for me it took me about two years yeah yeah before I could really start introducing foods again yeah it totally depends on where you're at when you come in and how I was on five foods for two years yeah and um it's really important to understand too like being on that restricted diet is really it's not good. My Mm. iodine was the lowest iodine I have ever seen. And my doctor had ever seen ever. Do you You remember what number it was at? It was below detectable level. Like on, it was the very bottom of the test. It was, it was like, you know, and that's the thing. A lot of my clients come in, they're really low in iodine, which is something that you just don't, it's not the first thing that people test for. Yeah, um, I've been testing a lot more for iodine and I'm seeing yeah. most people are low and I've read, um, I think the Australian soil and New Zealand have got some of the lowest levels in the world. So it's yeah. quite a common deficiency that's sort of forgotten about. Um, I and I was pretty low as well because I think you like to see it above 100 from memory and I was at about 12. So, yeah. Yeah. so mine wasn't that much better, but it was, at least it. It was detectable. <laughs> Yeah. And when you get onto these restricted diets, like you can, you know, you can come in with, like I have lots of people come in with low iron and all these kinds of things. And then when you are on a restricted diet like that over time, um, the longer you're on it, you can end up with then problems with things like teeth. You can end up, you know, with hair loss. You can end up with all these other things that are sort of downstream from Mm. the lack of absorption and the restricted diet, you know, for long periods. Time often think. like even like your rashes and eczema and psoriasis and yeah you know. sometimes that's like gut bacteria but sometimes it's also because you don't have enough of the right vitamins so your your skin cells are not renewing properly and things like that you know um so yeah you know it took me a while until I um, got food yeah sort of back into the diet and stuff like that but um and also, you know, it took a while to get supplements um, happening too. But once they did start happening, it happened quite quickly. Yeah, yeah. It was just really a matter of getting that nervous system into the right space. And once you can do that, then you can move on and get things happening, you know. Yeah, and the quicker you can get through that first stage where you're just highly in that really high stress state to getting back into a parasympathetic state. Yeah. Then the and more the, you can add those supplements in and then and then you can really move. But you yeah, when you can't take many supplements or many foods, it's it's slow. You know, yeah. Yeah. And one of the issues I see a lot is people trying to rush. Mm. Um, because you want to be fixed fast. Mm. And I did it myself. And I think the reason it took me so long is because of so many false starts, because I pushed myself too hard earlier on. 
Um, mm. And, you know, if you're trying and trying and trying to eat food or take supplements or whatever it is, and you're not ready yet, um, you can you you can feel a lot worse than if you gave yourself another week or another month or, and you just really paced yourself a little bit more. Mm. And it can happen. You can introduce stuff with no pain, no discomfort, nothing. Yeah. But sometimes we all want to just jump in and start. And then we're yeah. like, oh, no. And I think, well, that's sort of one of the problems in trying to treat ourselves. And I think every naturopath knows the the pitfalls of that, trying to treat ourselves, and we all do it. And sometimes, yeah, it is really helpful to have someone holding your hand and telling you that, yeah, yeah look, last week you you couldn't eat that or you couldn't do that or your energy was at three and now your energy is at five. And, yeah. to, and to tell you that you're progressing and, and, and yeah, just keep you kind of in check and sort of keep keep going, I guess. Yeah. Well, even I, I had people like I had, and that's the thing I had, um, people I would talk to on the, on the sort of brain retraining side. I had a psychologist as well, cause it's really good, you know, especially under Medicare in Australia, you can get support for that. And if you have a chronic illness, just having someone to talk to and help you with that is really helpful too. I had, um, uh, uh, someone I saw to help me review all my gut tests because I didn't want to just look at them myself because I know that when you're just self-treating, you can miss things and you really need that objective person to yeah. review things and, and things like that. So that's why I like to, you know, when I can work with people now, it's sort of like they don't have to do what I did. I had to go to about 10 different places to get all the information that I've pulled together mm. and I spent all this money and all these different I suppose um, all these hurdles I had to go through to find the information and just being able to pull it all together into one place and being able to help people with way more information in one spot so they don't need to go through quite as much of that pain that we went through when we were struggling along trying to you know figure out what we needed to do to heal yeah that makes a lot of sense I think it can be it can actually be really stressful when you're seeing multiple practitioners like sometimes it, it definitely adds to things but yeah even at one stage I was seeing an integrated doctor and a naturopath and they were both telling me different supplements to take and I think I ended up on over 10 things and I was sicker than ever I was just on too many things and I was overwhelmed and I didn't know what to take out and I just had different people telling me different things and I felt like I had to do all of it yes. and it can sometimes yeah you think that you're doing something to help yourself but you're actually just overwhelming your brain even more with and yes. you know and that fuels the problem itself so yeah, yeah it, it can be it can be tricky so yeah I can't imagine you going to seeing 10 people <laughs> would have been pretty overwhelming at times I'm sure yeah like when and the more complicated your illness gets the more that happens you know then I had an immunologist and you know and you've got all these specialists and you've got all this stuff going on and you're looking for all these answers but ultimately um it comes down to some really simple um connection between our gut and our brain really and how our brain controls every organ in our body mm. and how if we can get those humming along everything else just falls into place and yeah. there's so much less complex um, work that needs to be done on the body because our body can naturally heal itself. Our body is trying to get to homeostasis every single day. And sometimes we kind of need to get out of the way and let it do it, you know? I love that. Yeah, that's really good. <laughs> sometimes we're just in there trying to mess around too much and, and our bodies are really, really intelligent. So... Yeah, there's a lot of, it's amazing to look at. There's a lot of systems in place that try and bring back um, that normality. But yeah, the more we just keep pushing it and keep pushing it, the more the those, you know, fences fall down, I guess. And then and then it's hard to get back to normality again. So yeah, you just got to try and support, support your body and then it'll help you get mm. back to where you want to be, back to health again. So mm. yeah. I mean, our body is trying the hardest it can every single day to get back into balance you know like it's not trying to be mean to us <laughs> it's trying yeah. to do its best um to deal with you know what's happening and uh and really recognizing and understanding that and supporting it rather than fighting it is a big yeah part. and I think being grateful for symptoms is really important 
Yeah, um, yeah. Because, yeah, those symptoms tell us when something's wrong and yeah. then they help direct us to make change. And if we could keep ignoring the symptoms, then ultimately we'll end up sicker. So if we listen to our bodies and learn to really listen yeah. in and, and listen to those messages it's telling us, then it can it can guide us to where we need to go. Yeah, absolutely. And I definitely know, you know, I ended up where I ended up because I was not paying attention to a lot of those messages my body was sending me to tell me that way I was living my life and the things I was doing in my life were not in alignment with who I was and and what was right for me. But, you know, you don't um, necessarily notice those things as what they are until after the fact. Mm, until it's a bit too late <laughs> until <laughs> it takes a bit bit more time to get back than yeah. it probably would have if you'd got to it earlier so yeah you're probably a bit of a type a personality as well like yeah. me yeah, and, yeah, yeah you yeah. just want to keep go go going and yeah, yeah just ignore yeah. that and just keep yeah. going and keep going and then yeah it does take its toll so it does it yeah. does and I've got like I include a lot of mindset stuff as well now um you know, in my program, like lots of stuff around us um, looking at and dealing with um, either, you know, maybe it's boundaries, maybe it's self-belief, maybe it's um, emotions that are hanging around for years, you know, things like that, because um, clearing some of that stuff as well, mm -hmm. um, that helps us not end up back where we were. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I And I, I did a couple of sessions with you, which was yeah. fun. Yeah, good. I've also done my own fair share of seeing counsellors. I've done, I can't even remember the names of all the therapy, but I think that the, all of those things really have their place. Oh, yeah, I've done a lot of meditation. I've done retreats. I've done, um, yeah, sort of, um, yeah. I can't even remember. But, yeah, I'd also use sport a lot. So I've done a lot of yoga and Pilates and just and also more active sports as well. I think all of that stuff really helps. So, yeah, I think the exactly. biggest I think we should probably wrap it up or we'll just keep talking all night. But I think yeah, I know. Our, we're um, bad when we sit down biggest... for a cup of tea, it lasts for two hours. <laughs> I think our biggest takeaway, I think, from today, I think the biggest learning is that, yeah, the, the longer you leave a health problem, the longer it'll take to fix. And the yeah. quicker that you can see your symptoms and address them and, and help your body help you, then the quicker you'll get back to that place that you want to be and yeah. have more vibrant health I think I, I don't know what you've sort of concluding thoughts would be something. yeah I think you know that your body's sending you symptoms for a reason listen and don't um yeah don't let it get worse because over time these things can get worse um you know if they're not addressed and that's that's one of the the things that I always think oh if only I'd done this six years ago instead of waiting until I hit rock bottom you yeah. know um some of those things you really do think yeah I could have done so much more for myself um and uh maybe some of it's awareness and knowing what's available and that's why I really like doing this kind of thing because we can give people more information about yeah you know there's there are options and yeah. um you don't have to kind of just truck along dealing with it hoping it'll get better you know you can, things can change things can yeah. change so much yeah I think I shouldn't add another topic but yeah my mum being a nurse like I sort of thought that mainstream medicine was sort of my only route so yeah. I sort of trucked along on that sort of side of things for a long time and saw a lot of different specialists yeah. um yeah, and it just made it really slow for me, and I and I didn't really know that um, I did. China, I went to a Chinese medicine doctor for a bit, um, quite late in the piece, and then later it was another five, six years later I saw a naturopath, but I didn't even know that that was something that was out there as an option. So, yeah. um, hopefully, um, doing podcasts like these sort of helps people understand what we do as naturopaths and nutritionists. I think it's quite a misunderstood yeah. field, um, yeah. and yeah, it helps them understand how we can help really and that's it and a naturopath is not just herbs and a nutritionist <laughs> is not just food <laughs> we do a whole lot more we pretty much work in almost the same way um even though you know we have sort of slightly different um you know descriptive qualifications but you know we we look at addressing the whole person which is really important I think we probably should make our next topic just explaining what a nutritionist and a naturopath is it might be a a good topic for next time. Yeah, we'll do that one. 
all right well that was a good chat and um what we'll do is we'll yeah see if anyone has any other um uh ideas of things that they want us to chat about we'll happily we'll happily have some more chats about things like that and uh let us know what you think and um, you can check us out. Uh, my website is happywithouthistamine.com and Joey, what's yours? My, mine is still under my business name. It probably will change eventually, sort of rebranding, but um, at the moment it's just www.rekindledwellness, like rekindling a fire, I would say to people, and then it's a .com.au. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you've or, got yeah. Instagram though. You've got Happy Belly Method on Instagram. Yes. Um, and I've got happy with that histamine on Instagram. So people can find us there as well. Yeah. Well, we can probably pop the links at the bottom of the video so we can yeah. um, do that as well to make it easier. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, thanks, Joey. And uh, you have a good evening and uh, we'll see you guys soon. Bye. See you later.